Welcome everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here for me. Um, I'm a bit exotic here because I'm really a synthetic chemist. So I'm, per definition, I'm a trained chemist. And we entered the field cyanobacteria, um, let's say one and a half, two years ago. Um, so everything is new and uh, please don't expect uh, too much uh, results already. I wanna give you some ideas and concepts um, why we entered the field. And I'm glad that Andreas Schmidt is also here from Leipzig and uh, Robert Kuris from Graz, because those are also guys in the field of biocatalysis. And uh, that's also a reason why we are in this field. And um, as you see, the title cyanobacteria photobiocatalysis goes green and blue. I will start. And I will start with a very simple concept for um, as a chemist. Um, we want to produce things. We want to produce compounds and in the easiest way that's the best because when we put in some chemicals into a black box a reactor whatever it is we want to get a product out and um, in the best case this product um, is already purified yeah it's complex maybe um, but in the best case we don't have to do many things we wanted to have 100% efficiency of our process. We want to have 100% yield and 100% reproducibility. And of course, also in, in, in reality, if it's scalable, then it's good for industry. If it's not scalable, it's nice to do it in the lab, but in the end, um, at least at my university, because I'm from a technical university, you want to have an application later on. And per definition as a chemical process, um, this type of process that I showed you here on the last slide is a flow, pro a continuous process. With a continuous process, you can do this in single step or multi-step. It's depending on what's going on here. So how many reactions are taking place. So that sounds easy, simple, maybe also fancy. But um, when we think about it, this is nothing that is new. Um, nature is already doing that in a way. We have the perfect biochemical process. Um, here you see a cell, here you see an input like glucose um, goes in, in the cell, the cell represents the black box, and then many reactions uh, occur in the cell. Glycolysis, for example, 10-step synthesis, one pot, um, you gain ATP energy, NADH, um, that's it. And it's a very fast process, and, and I would also say it's an efficient process. Of course, it's not only one reaction that takes place, and it's only not one product you gain, but this is something we also uh, want to achieve in chemistry. And when we go a bit further and say we don't want to stay with uh, glycolysis with uh, primary metabolism, and we look into, let's say, secondary metabolites, where the structures itself are more interesting, uh, we look in plant metabolism, for example, limonene. As you can see it here, you know it maybe from orange, that's the characteristic smell of orange, um, where it's almost 15 steps which takes place in a cell, and you produce a lot of limonene in an orange peel. Or nicotine, maybe this is not the best example anymore because smoking is prohibited most of the time already and it's not healthy. But anyways, it's also 15 steps. It's an alkaloid, it's a plant metabolism, it's a secondary metabolite. We can go even com more complex, uh, for example, here morphine, also quite well known as a painkiller, um, and even further, in this case, Taxol as an anti-cancer drug. Yeah? So whatever we want to achieve in chemistry, multi-step catalysis, multi-step reactions in one pot, so we don't have to care about what's going on in this black box and synthesize complex molecules. So that's our idea, I would say. And everything that I showed you here, for example, started from a simple, let's call it simple precursor. It's, it's, a, it's a sugar, it's glucose. Um, why do we want to do such uh, cascade type reactions? Why, why is this so important? When you look in a classic chemical way and you want to do several reaction steps and you see it here, when we go from A to B, um, we have to isolate this compound, purify it, do the next reaction step, next reaction step, always isolation, purification, isolation. That's a classic synthetic approach. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of waste generation and everything. And that's, we don't want to do. In a cascade type, we would enter the whole step or the whole cascade by tossing in a substrate like glucose and then do multiple reactions and end up with our desired product. In the best case, we don't have any intermediate recovery step. We would call it sustainable because we uh, avoid any intermediate workup, which is nice because we reduce waste by that. Of course, also operation time and costs are limited or are reduced. Um, we also don't need maybe too many auxiliary chemicals. And a very important part is um, we could or we can shift the reaction equilibrium. What does this mean? Every reaction is in equilibrium in chemistry. And sometimes it's in unfavor of our product side. It's more on the, on the, on the, on the substrate side. Of course, we can push the equilibrium. 
But if we have a cascade reaction and we have one step in between, which is irreversible, we have already like this pool system, which pulls out everything and we come up to the end, to the final product without doing anything. So cas smart design of cascades can also um, bring me to the point that I get uh, to a final product um, without pushing the limits of equilibria. So these are advantages of it. And now I have to introduce you into a concept of chemistry and I try to simplify it in a way that it's, it's easy to understand also for a non-chemist person. Um, when we try to synthesize compounds, um, we always start with the target, which I showed you, for example, limonene. We have the structure limonene and we want to synthesize it. So we have to consider where do we start and how do we build up this molecule? And in the best case, we just cleave off tiny parts like here, so we get to easier intermediates, simpler intermediates, until we end up with an intermediate um, that is commercially available and cheap, for example. So that's the idea behind it. So this is called retrosynthesis in, in chemistry. And we have this type of um, um, methods we, we, we apply, like functional group transformation, um, linear synthetic roots. They have to be bioorthogonal, et cetera. We can also think about it then in the other way around. So once we have these materials here, we think of how we introduce like the black and the, and the red symbols, how we get them together, how we combine them, and we do a chemical reaction. In this case, for example, an enzymatic reaction by an alcohol dehydrogenase or any other enzymatic reaction. And then we come up with this new compound. And so we build up our molecule until we reach the target. We have a lot of different enzymes or catalysts available. In chemistry, you can also use metal catalysts or organocatalysts, but I'm more in favor of enzymes. The beauty of them are they are highly regiochemo and stereoselective. What does this mean when we look, for example, for this particular reaction, this blue part can be introduced here, but it can also be introduced on the other side. And this gives a completely new compound. This has nothing to do with our real target. So this means, for example, um, regio or chemo selectivity. And this is very nice. And when we have a look at some structures, and uh, don't get lost here, but in the end, that's what you see here in the middle. This is toluene, for example. Toluene is a solvent. Maybe most of you know benzene, maybe, or toluene as an organic solvent. Benzene is, is, is carcinogenic, um, it's toxic. Toluene is more uh, friendly to us. But everything starts from here to build up complex molecules. So we have this in mind, and then we uh, do the same as you see in the upper line uh, and reduce the complexity until we come up to something that is super cheap and super easy to handle. And here we have also two enzymes already, which can do completely nice different reactions. In this case, it's regio selectivity. So this is the idea um, to make retrosynthesis, um, build chemical pathways with enzymes, in the best case, in a living cell, in a black box that we call the living cell and make new completely uh, naturally unrelated artificial metabolic pathways. Now you can say that's cool, interesting, nice concept. Yes, but the retrosynthesis concept is already uh, published in 1982 uh, by Stuart Warren, uh, the disconnection approach. And even more uh, like a, a hint also for young scientists is dig deep into literature because the idea of making artificial enzymatic pathways is already known since the 1948. Um, Malcolm Dixon already published his book here, uh, Oxford uh, Cambridge Press, uh, Multi-Enzyme Systems. So when you think you have a brand new idea, uh, check the literature carefully yeah? or try to avoid, we have the novel and newest synthesis of something yeah? because maybe it's not true. Okay, anyways, those two Kent concepts is the basis what we want to want to do. And I guess most of you know the definition of what biocatalysis is. I'm not sure if everybody really knows, but I have it here. Biocatalysis refers to the use of living systems, biological systems, um, or their parts to speed up. And this, here's a simple example um, to synthesize ampicillin, um, because um, most of you maybe are familiar with that. This is a simple enzyme, it's penicillin acylase. Um, and you can connect here this um, artificial amino acid with this um, uh, other acid and make an amide bond here and produce it by an enzyme. Yeah, and so it's a biocatalytic process and um, we produce a novel compound. This can be done either with just the enzyme or we can use organisms for that. And in organisms mean, in this case, we produce our enzyme in this organism 
to make our desired reaction. And which organism we choose, yeah, this is now the good question. It's heavily depending on many things. So um, this is the classical biocatalysis concept. You use an enzyme, a cell, uh, whole cells can be a cell extract. It can be an isolated enzyme. You do one step by this mediator, a substrate into a product, classic one step reaction. Another part, which maybe is not classically biocatalysis, but everybody is familiar with that, I guess, is metabolic engineering. So you have your cellular system, you have your cellular uh, chassis, and there is the, uh, the cellular network running, the metabolic network. And now we use this network and we, we modify the network in a way that we reroute the nutrient that goes in into the direction I want to have it until I get to my final product. And of course, I have to do this very smart because if I do this in the wrong way and I twist the wrong screws, um, then my cell is dying. Yeah? So we have to be really careful by that. But it's, it's very, uh, let's say, important uh, field of research. I would say biocatalysis is more derived from the chemistry area, whereas uh, metabolic engineering is classically from the biology driven research, yeah? or the bio chemistry research. Yeah? And now this is the part where we step in and say, okay, now let's combine those two things, make this together, yeah? combine it, make artificial metabolic pathways, make multi-step biocatalysis in a living system. That's the idea. I wanna give you two examples now, first for, for, the, for A and then for C, um, that you get an idea uh, what people are now already doing in this field. And this is from a company, um, this is from Merck and as the production of Cedacliptine. And I want to show you this here because this was the chemocatalytic step and don't get lost in the structures. It's just something that the final step is done under a metal catalysis. You have rhodium there and nobody wants to have in the final drug at the end, any kind of metal. You don't want to have that yeah? and you have to get rid of it. And also what's nicely written here of this Josephos, nobody wants to have that. So you have to remove it carefully and really show it that, that nothing is in there. So this is a very costly process because the purification is very tricky to achieve. And this company, and so they have this running process and it's established and they made the compound, but they said, can we substitute this last step here or this step from here to here by an enzymatic process? And that's what they did. And when you have a look here at this part here, this is exchanged by a nitrogen. It's an amino group. So it's a reductive amination type of, it's a transaminase, it's a transamination reaction is something that occurs in a living cell. And you maybe know that from, let's say, uh, glutamate uh, to glutamine um, or uh, glutamate, glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate. It's the classic where you transfer the amino group. And this is the same enzyme type and they developed this enzyme. And you see here this 99.5% optical purity. It was even higher than in the chemical process. You don't have any metal in there. Um, and now they substituted the pure chemical process by a biocatalytic one. It's a single step process and it's done on industrial scale. Of course, this is a drug. So the, the whole process can be a bit more expensive than for bulk chemicals. The second example, and I'm glad that Andreas Schmidt is here because I love to show this example from his group and because I was very fascinated when they published it at that time. Um, and this is a simple process where they used like this um, fatty ester um, com uh, compounds and do some hydroxylation oxidation reactions here in this process. And this is ALK-PGT, which is a monooxygenase enzyme. And they make multi-step oxidation, so two-step oxidation, and then also a transamination reaction to end up with this type of, let's say, amino acids, long fatty chain amino acids. And those are precursors for um, high performance polymers. And this would be a, a talk of its own and Andreas could tell much more, um, but they really made it to, uh, to a pilot plant scale already. Yeah? And this was done in E. coli. But I like to bring this because it's, I think it's a very nice success story in the field. We are doing most of our things in heterotrophic uh, organisms so far. And um, because we know heterotroph metabolite or the metabolism that derives its energy from organic compounds, most of the time glucose. And when we do that, um, and we do metabolic engineering and we just reroute the glucose into our new compound, I think that's okay. But in biocatalysis, you just let the cell grow, produce your catalyst, make your reaction and then trash everything else. So you use the glucose, but you don't use it for your actual transformation, which is actually not very efficient. Um, but yeah, that was at the time state of the art, so we couldn't change that. A photoautotrophic system would be much nicer because 
we get uh, the light from, also uh, uses light as energy source, and we can use CO2 as a very cheap um, um, carbon source. And of course, this is not in competition with any, uh, I don't know, uh, agricultural, food industry, anything. It, it's CO2, we have plenty of it. So in, in theory, it's nice. Yeah, We have light, we have CO2, so everything is perfect. We are not in di direct competition with any other type of industry. So therefore, the idea to change into this type of organism was very intriguing. And therefore, cyanobacteria is, is, is one of the choices here. And a few things that are really interesting is, of course, the carbon fix. But I think very important is the intracellular uh, oxygen production and electrons that are provided by those organisms. And those two things um, are for us very important. And therefore, I would say we are also really getting into this field. And uh, I want to show you in the, in the future uh, slides why. And you, I hope you can give you an idea why we think this is so interesting. Um, when we have a look at the cell um, and we, we look at it as a, as a cyanobacterial cell, what do we have as key facts there? Of course, we can uh, fixate the CO2, that's fine. Um, we have the cellular metabolism, so we, of course, also produce uh, compounds there. Um, but as a biocatalytic person, as a chemist, we are mostly or uh, mainly not interested in those metabolites. We want to synthesize novel compounds, which we uh, we're thinking of on a drawing board, like this is what we want to have. This is what industry requires. So this is what we want to synthesize. So we are not uh, relying on the natural metabolism. Now yeah? we want to do something new, extend it. And most of the things we are doing, or at least we are interested in, are redox reactions. For redox reactions, you need uh, cofactors. You need redox equivalents. Um, then most of the time, we're also interested in oxygenation reactions, introduction of oxygens, functionalize compounds. Um, and those are things that are actually all of them combined in, in, in cyanobacteria. And if we, if we consider such a, um, an organism for, for biocatalysis and, and biotechnology, of course, we have to think about a few parameters which are very important to tackle until we get to the point where we get into an in industrial application is, for example, is whatever we want to feed in except CO2 getting really into the cell? Do we have a mass transfer of our artificial substrate or product? Is it getting in, is it getting out? What about stress tolerance? Because when we deal with organic compounds, of course, these are compounds which are not known to the organism. So how can they deal with stress? How can they deal with uh, reactive oxygen species? I would argue, and I guess you would also argue, they should be perfectly fitted for RS, RS, because I mean, they produce it in situ already. Yeah? But so that would be good to know. And um, if they can handle that well, that would be perfect because this ROS can kill our, our enzymes, which we introduce. And reducing power, are we really re relying only on NADPH or NADH? Can we get also electrons from other areas um, to use it as redox equivalents? Or do we have already more than in other organisms which we can use for redox reactions? Then, of course, what about productivity? That's about growth. That's about protein expression. Um, that's about um, illumination, of course. Yeah? And then there's always a nice fact of the green chemistry aspects, because, of course, cyanobacteria are also green, but uh, biocatalysis are also dedicated to be the green science or so. But if we really think about it and calculate it through, that's actually not really true most of the time. There are several reasons for that. I don't have time to talk about this part, but um, because we're doing biology or biocatalysis or metabolic engineering, that doesn't mean that it is a green process. Yeah? Just to keep in mind. Yeah? We can discuss this later on. Yeah, there's plenty of room of discussions. Good. Um, now a bit of a closer look why we think that cyanobacteria are interesting for us in, in biocatalysis, and here we have a schematic illustration of our the tidyquid uh, membrane, is because many biocatalysts which we are dealing, redox biocatalysis, uses NADPH as a cofactor. And so there is a lot of NADPH potentially there. Um, then direct electron transfer from uh, photosynthetic proteins directly to the biocatalyst would be something that is interesting. Um, then, of course, um, the fusion of the biocatalyst to electron transfer from protein ferrotoxin, again, for electron transfer, improved electron transfer, which is for redox biocatalysis is very important. And then a very tricky part also is the oxygen 
Yeah? Oxygen that is produced within a cell, because if the oxygen that you need for your reaction is not produced within the cell, so you have to get it from outside into the cell, this is a tricky part because oxygen is a gas. The uh, solubility of oxygen in water is rather limited. You have to cross the membrane of a cell. You have to get it into the cell to the enzyme. Um, these are often limiting aspects. Good. Um, I will focus on oxygenases. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with enzyme classes. That's why I depicted this figure a scheme. This is actually from Kurt Faber's uh, book, The Bible of uh, Biocatalysis, I would say, um, where we see, and I will focus on uh, monooxygenases. Uh, where we have a substrate and a single molecule, a single atom of oxygen is incorporated into a substrate, is oxidized, whereas we have a donor molecule, which is uh, again oxidized, um, and we produce water. Dioxygenases are listed here, but I'm not talking about dioxygenases. Huh? Um, as an example, I will give you here, for example, a cytochrome P450 enzyme. Uh, it's a part of super family of heme containing enzymes, monooxygenases, what they are doing. For example, cyclohexane here, oxygen, it's oxidized here. One oxygen is getting in here. We consume NADPH. Yeah? This is one classic example. Or when we talk about flavin dependent enzymes, flavin dependent monooxygenases, for example, um, we have here in monooxygenases ALK PGT, which is uh, used by Andreas Schmidt in the uh, example that I showed before where we can oxidize here and introduce again oxygen from molecular oxygen into water. And our workhorse, and this is what I want to focus on later on a bit, is a biovillega monooxygenases, where we can cleave this carbon-carbon bond and introduce here again an oxygen. So we make from a ketone an ester, a cyclic ester. But the main fact is we use molecular oxygen and incorporate this molecular oxygen in our uh, compound. So if we want to set up such uh, metabolic pathways, um, it's, I think, crucial to, to stick to this type of um, design, build, test, learn cycle. I guess most of you are maybe familiar with that. I'm not sure this is also derived from metabolic engineering. You have your target compound, your compound of interest. Um, then uh, you select your cascade components, your enzymes, your substrates, your catalysts, whatever you want to combine. Then maybe you test them in, in single step reactions before you combine this path where you want to see, is it working? Is it not working? Does it the job or not? I don't know. I want to test it because before I start the cloning with 10 enzymes in a new organism, I want to see that at least each individual step is working nicely. And then I compose and construct my pathway. Um, and in the best case, I test it also. But most of the time I will figure out, yeah, there are, it's not working as I want to because there are some bottlenecks. Um, so we have to characterize our new pathway and identify the bottlenecks and then um, figure out how we can solve them or how we, we can tackle those problems. And then there are several optimization strategies there, um, which you can use on the genetic level, of course, promoter systems, uh, ribosome binding sites can be done. You can um, uh, manipulate the, the RNA, um, stabi increase stability. You can do uh, on an enzymatic level, um, uh, modifications and optimizations, or, um, of course, on an engineering level, there's also a lot of things you can do. Yeah? So this is like this closed cycle. I want to show how we think of setting up such a cascade type reaction. And now I want to give you an example of our research. Um, sorry for, for Robert and, and, and Andy, this is old for you, but this was my uh, concept I want to bring. So we have our target compounds here, these lactones. And first we do a retrosynthetic analysis as I showed you before. So where we get it to an easier and more easy accessible compound. In this case, we make a, a reduction in this case to the ketone, um, then double bond introduction, a reduction to the alcohol here. And that can get rid of this alcohol here and start with this alkene structure. And when we look at it in the forward way, we see we can have several enzymatic reactions. In the first case, we introduce oxygen here in this allylic position. Then we oxidize this alcohol to a ketone, then reduce the double bond to a saturated ketone, and then introduce this one. The nice thing about this cascade is, even though I didn't show that it is an equilibrium in each reaction step, this reaction is the equilibrium almost exclusively on this side. And for this reaction, the last one, it's also almost exclusively on the product set. Again, what you also see is um, these are redox reactions. So we use a lot of redox equivalents, NADP+, NADPH, they are recycled. So in the best case, you would have a self-sustaining system, but it's in this case not possible because we have more enzymes that consume NADPH than they are producing. And 
in the first step here and in the last step, we need molecular oxygen for this type of reaction. So this was our idea to set up this type of cascade. Of course, in the beginning, it was just for basic research reasons, but you can ask why you want to do that. And I give you an example why we did that, because we wanted to use a natural occurring substrate, which derives from an orange, in this case, from an orange peel, and want to produce a polymer, at least uh, the monomers for the polymer production. What is this magic compound? It's limonene. It's, it's the, the other compound of, uh, of, of the orange peel. And it's very cheap, as you can see here. And it's produced uh, in tons, ton scale per year. And the simple reason for that is because we drink a lot of orange juice. And uh, we don't need the orange peel, but the orange peel is waste. Um, but what we at least can extract from that is this uh, volatile compound limonene. And then we considered, OK, how can we get from this compound, this natural renewable compound, to something like a polymer? And then we come up with a pathway, as I showed you on the slide before, where we have this a bit shortened to get to this uh, compound here. And when we open this, we can polymerize it, and then we end up with this uh, mechanical, robust thermoplastic biopolymer. That was the principle and also the application for that. So the idea was, how can we use this orange peel? Yeah? I mean, we, we, we cut a lot of orange peels, and we ate a lot of oranges. And we ate uh, the bio-derived ones and the, the, the non-bio-derived ones and smaller and bigger and different supermarkets. Um, it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it's more important how you, uh, in which uh, piece size you slice uh, the peel. Yeah? If it's too small, you lose a lot of limonene already because the surface area gets bigger. If they're too big, the extraction maybe is a problem. So these are the trickier parts. But it was in winter times and it was before Corona. So we had a lot of nice oranges around and punch and yeah. So the idea was what can we do with the orange peel? We can dissolve it and then extract the limonene. Also, dissolution of the orange peel itself, or we extract it to get the limonene, then combine it with the multi enzyme reaction. We come up with four different concepts how to do that. First was we wanted to extract it with an organic solvent. So we toss in water, orange peel, and extract it with an organic solvent. The problem is limonene is so lipophilic, it will not go into water. It stays in the organic phase. You need mo molar ranges, uh, molar concentrations, so it's not working. So what about extraction? Just cutting the peel, put it in water, and see what's happening. Um, without, or in this case, with additives. And we used ionic liquids because ionic liquids help to extract from a biomass. Then just simple water, not, no, no additives, or we completely dissolve it, um, the biomass, with ionic liquids, for example, and then use the limonene. And then uh, with these concepts in hands, we were thinking of getting to our compound and get to our polymer. And cutting a very long story short, I show you here. We first had our few enzymes in E. coli expressed, starting from this compound, which is not the limonene. The limonene is here. But the first steps were working nicely, I would say. The scale was not tremendous. I would say for, for cyanobacteria, five millimolar concentrations even quite decent, I would say, still, um, for at least an artificial pathway. Uh, the conversion was nice about the four steps and so forth. Uh, for the first step, we used another enzyme, which we unfortunately couldn't express in E. coli. Uh, because it's a dioxygenase in this case, and it was not possible to be expressed in E. coli properly. So we used a two-organism um, system, toss both of them together and see what was happening. And in the end, it turns out just cutting orange peel in the media directly, toss in the, the two organisms. And what you get here is um, when we just use, for example, um, limonene, pure without the orange peel, we get to this desired product in after 20 hours, almost full conversion, which was really nice. And when you use orange peel, um, you get here to at least 29% yield over four steps, just cutting the orange peel and toss it in. So the proof of concept was nicely demonstrated. Yeah? And so this was our idea from waste to value uh, with redox reactions. And now we can think of if we can do this whole part in one organism, which helps us to provide the oxygen, the redox equivalents, that would be a, a nice idea. And, and, and that's also why we said, okay, with redox catalysis, cyanobacteria field is something that is really interesting for us. And um, another aspect, and uh, why we think that cyanobacteria are so important for us is, um, and now I will, uh, 
go a bit more into the mathematical direction or modeling direction is um, in the biocatalysis field, we have always this, this um, how do you say, whenever you have an unstable enzyme, people say, ah, go into a cellular system and then it's stable. That's what we did. Um, we said, okay, that's why we use living cells. That's great. So we have our cascade here, and we said, can we can we can we um, model our system? Can we make an in vivo system, an in vivo model system of our cell? So we have our reaction steps here, based on Michaelis Menten kinetics. Uh, we know about uh, time points which product is formed. We know the uh, cofactors of our enzyme. In this case, magnesium, FMN, FAD. So it's flavin dependent enzymes. We know that we need NADPH. Let's see if we can model that. Um, is this working nicely or not? So the parameter M is a parent concentration of active enzyme in the cell, yeah? and the parameter be fitted with experimental data. And we did another assumption that we said, okay, NADP plus uh, the ratio to NADPH is constant. So that was our assumption for the model. So we have our three enzymes here. We modeled it, and at this graph, you see uh, some lines and you might see some dots. It's good that you don't see the dots because the dots are our experimental data and the lines are our fitted data from the model and they are overlapping completely. So in principle, it looks very nice. The only thing that we figured out is this here, where we don't have any experimental data. And the simple reason for that is, now you can argue students are lazy or they need sleep because it's exactly after four hours of reaction time and then next day, 18 hours back in the lab, which I totally understand. I never force students to stay overnight, but this is actually what's happening. In this time, we missed these data points, so we couldn't see what's happening. But the model told us that actually we accumulate this kind of product, this intermediate, which is this one. And the last reaction is really slow, and it takes a lot of time to get into this uh, product. And the question was, why is this the case? And um, we have a very good model. We have a very active enzyme, which we know actually that this enzyme is the, act, the most active one when we have it in isolated form, but in this cascade, it's not. So what is it? Based on our expression SDS gel, it's balanced. So we don't know it. Yeah? But when we calculate it in the model, we see that we have a thousand fold lower real active enzyme in a cell. So something must be wrong here. And we don't know what it was at that time. So we created two hypotheses. One was, okay, we have the, the cofactors are not efficient enough there, or we have an unstable enzyme. So we did a test experiment. We made a crude cell extract of the system um, with all the enzymes expressed, added NADP plus and NADPH, and could already increase or speed up the reaction. And what you see here is when we add flavin cofactors and NADPH and NADP plus, yeah, that um, after three hours, the reaction is done, except before 24 hours. So we know already that the, the cofactors and everything that the cell should provide is not efficient for us because then we cannot run an efficient process. So that was one idea. The other question still remains is, do we have an unstable enzyme? Because it can also be, we express it, but it's not stable. So we see it on the SDS gel, but it's not functional anymore. So what can happen? And then we, we thought about it. And this is something that was weird at that time, because there was a published half lifetime of our enzyme of choice of 1.6 minutes, six minutes. That means after 1.6 minutes, only 50% are still active and they are. So how can we run any biocatalytic reaction with such a lousy enzyme? There was a big question. And at that time in the literature, nobody asked this question. They just publish it. And this was really crazy because how can you do that? 20 years in, in, in science, um, this enzyme was used on preparative scale, and then you come up with such a value. So we were struggling and thought about why can this be so low? What are the reasons for that? And when we look at the enzyme and we look at the mechanism, we come up with some ideas. Okay, we need NADPH. Can this be stabilizing the enzyme if we have enough of it there? FAD. Do we have enough FED? We know already we don't have enough FED in our cascade because the first enzyme needs FMN and in the biosynthetic pathway, FMN is before FED, so it's a competition. So maybe if this is not bound properly, uh, we have an unstable enzyme. If the cofactor is not binded properly, the prosthetic group, maybe this destabilizes the enzyme. We need oxygen. So um, do we consume this oxygen completely to our desired oxygenated product or do we generate ROS, something we 
don't know, but we thought, okay, this might be an issue of stability. So based on those considerations, we were thinking of, okay, um, we established a general protocol to improve enzyme stability. So we had a closer look at NADPH concentration quantitatively and qualitatively. We had a look at FAD concentration. We had a look at protein-protein interaction. We had a look at the influence of ROS and the temperature. And for those things, everybody that is uh, dealing with ROS in, in living systems, no uh, catalase and superoxide dismutase are those enzymes that nature evolved for this reason to get rid of it. So with that, let's put it, add it, and see what's happening. And we started here um, by increasing the enzyme concentration, 7.7 .7 minutes of half-life time, and could increase it to 883 minutes by just adding catalase, superoxide dismutase, a bit of FAD, and NADPH. 88-fold increase, no protein engineering, not another enzyme, just this. And if we had a bit of a look at the temperature, when you decrease it by 10 degrees, we can even boost it to 3,400 minutes. So we could even further increase it to 92 fold, uh, just by simply thinking about mechanism and what can be wrong and what's going on. So um, in the end, when we start here, we have 442 fold increase in stability, where we considered NADPH, ROS, uh, and temperature. Now we proved that also in this particular reaction, which is not super important. I want to just show you here. When we use the enzyme without any additives, we stop at 20% conversion. And if we add our everything that we considered, this is nice. So what does this mean for us? This means that we have a, a, a severe problem of stability of our enzyme, in, in vitro at least. And I think we also have the same problem in a living cell. Because when you look at the metabolic uh, concentrations of those particular NADPH, FAD, we don't have these concentrations that we would need. So we will never have an active enzyme amount that we would require for this type of reactions. Yeah? These are critical additives. This we want to have. Um, and this brings us to the point that actually everybody was using E. coli so far. And I think this is simply a wrong organism. And this also brings us to the point where we said, um, I think we should uh, change this and think of other organisms. And there also cyanobacteria was one choice because of, we have the oxygen there directly in there. We can deal with ROS immediately. We have electrons sufficiently there. So this would be really a nice idea to stabilize the enzyme in these type of organisms. And that's why um, also I bring this example as a conceptual idea um, why we think we should move into cyanobacteria research. Um, and now I go back a bit to uh, cyanobacteria and also to our recent review that we published. Um, everybody's familiar in the field, I guess, with the problem of upscaling. This is an issue with photobacteria because of illumination and which type of reactor design we need. And there are a few out there and I don't wanna to talk too much about it because I guess my time is already also over. Um, but these are classical tubular reactor, flatbed reactor, airlift, bubble cam, whatever. Um, because we have the problem of if we have too high cell densities, illumination is an issue and uh, we don't get the light where it should be, right? This is tricky and uh, I'm not, Sure, if you are familiar with the work of Dechema and, and, and Burek, Bastian Burek, um, about um, coated wireless light emitters. Um, maybe you have seen that, and I hope you saw that because I think it's a really smart technology um, where you actually use a power supply and inducing coil, you have this wireless energy transfer transmitters. Um, and with this light transfer, you uh, illuminate, like you, you turn on an LED. And this LED can be whatever LED you want to. And this looks like this. You have your LED here, receiving coil here. This is coated here. In this case, also photocatalyst is there. And to do photocatalysis on the surface of these um, uh, beads or these emitters. Yeah? This can, of course, be avoided if you just need the light there. And this is rather small because we have here a pen ascent. And this is really small, tiny little bowls. And the nice thing about them is, and I want to show you um, a video here um, where they showed it. This looks this is the experimental setup um, where you see the coils around a flask and you have the bubbles are like these balls in here. This is blue light as you can see. So they turned on the electricity. Now the bubble through a gas can be argon or it can be carbon dioxide depending on what you want to do. In this case, they want to do photocatalysis here. Now they're floating around and they're illuminating within this um, uh, flask. 
So you don't have the problem that you have to get the light from outside to inside because it's already in there yeah? and it's really lights it up. Yeah? So I, when I saw it the first time, I was really like intrigued. This is a really smart design. And another example here, this is not only bigger, it's also bigger. Um, but what you can see here is different colors. So of course you can change the color. I mean, this was just for fun there, um, but depending on which wavelength you wanna have, which LEDs you can get, you can use whatever you want and just make your uh, 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 small wireless emitters, put them in a, in a tubular reactor. This is standard, there's nothing fancy with a gas permeable part where you can float it around and then you have your illumination there. And they of course also publish that and um, could show when you just illuminate in this case, this organism um, by, from outside, you have a really low illumination especially when you get to high cell densities or larger reactors. But with these bubbles, I mean, you have a perfect um, illumination all over. Of course, there are drawbacks. I, I don't say that this, this is the, the holy, this is, this, this is what we are aiming for, but this is a very nice concept and I wanted to, to, to bring it to you. And I think with that, this is uh, almost my last slide. Um, I want to draw attention to our recent uh, review that we published um, with uh, my excellent uh, PhD student, Julia and Tom, who are doing the biocatalysis as the cyano bacteria research in the group. And they did a great job, especially setting up everything from scratch. And now we are really operable. So thanks to them. I hope, I guess they're also in the audience. And then I uh, just want to thank all the funding and I'm glad that Robert uh, Kurist and Andreas Schmidt are there because those are really the pioneers in biocatalysis dealing with cyanobacteria. And Bruno Bühler is not here, um, but um, yeah. So I think we are the cyano group in the biocatalysis field. And uh, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. <laughs>